Music from Historic Houses. BBC presents a series in which you'll hear music associated with and played in the stately homes of Britain. In this programme, we visit Hampton Court Palace. Your guides are Richard Dimbleby and Dennis Stevens. Of the old royal palaces of medieval England, few survive, and those woefully changed, so that it's hard to picture the busy life of the court that once thronged them. Yet, close to London, there is one palace, royal in size and in history, but which began as a country house, the home of the greatest subject this country ever saw, Thomas Wolsey, Cardinal Archbishop of York, Chancellor of England. Best approached by water, it is to the traveller on the River Thames that the immense brick pile of courtyards and turrets speaks with most effect. Still lauding it over the green turf and the avenues of the home park, the canals and long water, the old world plots and paths, pools and fountains of the privy garden and pond garden, the great mass of courtyards and turrets, of battlements and tall twisted chimneys, holds itself aloof from the modern life so near it in space, yet so far off in time. For Hampton Court is the last true survivor of the ancient royal residence, a house which was more than a house, a collection of many houses grouped together while forming parts of a greater unity, the house of the Lord King himself, with its hall, its presence chamber, its kitchen, its chapel, and its covered tennis court. And though for two centuries now the sovereign has no longer kept court here, the palace is still the home of many private persons, widows or children of distinguished servants of the crown, to whom apartments are allotted by the sovereign's grace and favour. And so it is that Hampton Court is still alive, lived in, a multiple home, and not a mere monument or a museum. From the main entrance, we reach the great west front of Woolsey's original house, crossing the moat by a stone bridge surmounted by carved figures of the king's beasts, heraldic lions and monsters. Ahead lies a range of Henry VIII's buildings, and beyond them the lofty classical palace of Sir Christopher Wren, built in 1689-94 for William and Mary. For Hampton Court belongs to two utterly different historical periods, that of the early Tudors, still living in the aftermath of the Middle Ages, and that of the last Stuarts and the first Georges, facing modern times. Hampton Court has always been a home of music. Woolsey's establishment included a chapel served by 12 priests, 12 choir boys, and 16 lay clerks. Their musical quality so far surpassed that of the Chapel Royal that Henry VIII said that but for the love he bore towards Wolsey, he would have boys and men and all. Wolsey's master of the choristers was Richard Piggott, a musician whose excellence as a choir trainer was pointed out by the Dean of St Paul's. 
Pigott's music would not necessarily have been sung in chapel. It would also have been sung, as we hear it now, in the banqueting hall. One of his finest carols has both Latin and English words. Quid petis ophelia. As Chancellor, Woolsey also retained a group of minstrels, distinguished instrumentalists, who at the entertainment given to the French ambassadors in 1527 produced such a pleasant noise of divers instruments of music that the Frenchmen, as it seemed, were wrapped into a heavenly paradise. King Henry himself was a noted composer and singer and played well on the harpsichord, the organ and the lute. During the three years of his marriage to the ill-fated Anne Boleyn, while the palace was still building, Henry would sing to his queen's accompaniment on the virginals. Ten years later, it was the king who, on the lute, accompanied the songs of his court jester, Will Summers. This fantasia for three stringed instruments by Henry is a good example of his prowess in musical composition.
music flourished too during the reign of Elizabeth I, for she also was an accomplished player on the harpsichord and lute, and it was at Hampton Court that the Scots envoy, Sir James Melville, overheard the Queen playing. I heard such melody, said Melville, as ravished me, whereby I was drawn in ere I knew how. The Queen was a good dancer too, and kept up with this favourite court pastime well into her old age. In 1599, four years before she died, Elizabeth visited Hampton Court and was seen, through a window, dancing to the tune of the Spanish Pavan. On another occasion, when the Queen danced a number of galliards, a foreign visitor was taken aback by the prospect of such apparent frivolity on the part of the head of the Church of England. These two galliards were both written by musicians in the Queen's service, Hoban and Bassano, and they're set out for the usual group of five instruments, two violins, two violas and bass. Even in Cromwell's time, music was not wanting, for at the protector's death, the great hall was found to contain a large organ and a chair or choir organ, which had been specially brought from Magdalen College, Oxford. And within a year of Cromwell's death, in 1659, there was born a son to one of the gentlemen of the Chapel Royal. The boy, Henry Purcell, grew up to be not only the greatest figure in English music of Charles II's time, but one of the greatest English musicians of all time. His 
Ode for Queen Mary's Birthday, performed at Hampton Court, is great music, fit for the noble state rooms of Wren's new palace, the English answer to Versailles. Let it end our visit to Hampton Court just as his overture began it.
greater weight and did require the self same power which did frail humankind create when they were lost them to restore. It was a work of full as greater weight and did require the self same power which did frail humankind create when they were lost them to For a like act, fate gave a princess birth, which heading to the saints made joy in heaven as well as triumph upon earth, which heading to the saints made joy in heaven as well as triumph. So great, so great, so good a queen was given to it. So great, so good a queen was given. No more, no more shall we the great, the great Eliza boast. No more, no more.
You have been listening to a program in the series Music from Historic Houses. The singers were Edgar Fleet and Roger Stallman with the Ambrosian Singers and the Academy of St. Martin in the Fields. Your guides were Richard Dimbleby and Dennis Stevens. The historical research was by John Harvey and the program was recorded in Hampton Court Palace by the BBC Transcription Service.